Good evening. Last week we opened this series on life with crime with an interview with a former notorious criminal, John McVicker. Tonight we talk to a member of that profession whose job it is to visit the scene of the crime, find out who committed it, and then arrest and charge them. In other words, the CID. My guest this evening has had a lifetime of experience in detective work. Leonard Nipper Reed started on the beat in London in 1947. Soon after, he transferred into the Plain Clothes Division and has since been responsible for the arrest and conviction of many criminals, his most famous case being the capture of the Cray brothers. In 1972, he was given the country's top CID job as head of the powerful regional crime squad, and in 1976, he was awarded the Queen's Police Medal after being commended for his work 16 times. He is now security advisor to the National Gallery and Museums. Mr. Reed, what uh, made you become a policeman? Well, it was a mixture of things, really. I'd uh, served in the Navy. Before that, I'd been in a factory, in Players Factory, in fact, in Nottingham. Then I served in the Navy, which gave me an entirely different view of life, more freedom and so on. And I was convinced that there was no way that I was going to work back in a factory. And so I decided on the police force uh, because it was a career. And secondly, because at that time it, was, it held out a very... Uh, attractive prospect of having a pension uh, with the job and so that really was what what attracted me but of course uh, I was limited in where I could go and that's why I came in the Metropolitan because of the height problem. Well I was going to ask you what about the nickname Nipper how yes. did that come about? Well from two for two reasons really I think one because of my height because I was rather short always very short at school and so I got the nickname Titch or Nipper then and then when I joined the service the police service uh, I was amongst much taller people and so it continued and it's, it's stuck with me ever since. Now, I understand as a, a young man, you were quite a boxer, weren't you? Yes, I was. For three years, I was the police champion boxer. And that, of course, was another reason why the name of Nipper was perpetuated. Now, did this boxing skill of yours uh, come in handy at any time when you uh, uh, were engaged in arresting criminals? Uh, I mean, were you ever engaged in any, in any rough stuff? Well, fortunately, not too much, but there was one occasion when I was arresting a man who was trying to escape from police custody in a, in a police station yard. And I started a fight with him and eventually managed to overcome him and he was taken back into custody. But sometime later, I realised that I'd lost my skill at boxing because I'd broken the knuckles in both of my hands. On this occasion? On this occasion, yes. Now, you've been in the detective branch for most of your career. Has the pattern of crime and uh, criminality changed at all during your time? Well, it's changed enormously and, and very obviously. I mean, in volume, it's changed, completely changed. I mean, it, it's, it's uh, uh, increased so much that it, it's, it's quite disproportionate. But also, it's changed in uh, uh, the physical violence that's involved in crime. Because when I started as a detective, the, the housebreaker was an entirely different kettle of fish from the man that we get today. Uh, in my day, he wouldn't naturally resort to violent violence. He wanted to, uh, to do it to his work. He wanted to be as professional as he possibly could. He didn't want to get caught, obviously. But if he was caught, then in the majority of cases anyway, he would surrender. He would see that there was no means of escape. He would try to talk his way out of something if he was stopped by a, a householder or, uh, or someone that uh, appeared to be an authority other than a policeman, he tried to talk his way out. Mm. But invariably, when he was finally and, and, and positively captured, then he would say, well, that's it. It was the old thing of it being a fair cop governor. Now, with uh, modern methods of detection, is it easier or is it harder to catch criminals these days? Well, it's easier in the sense that they've got a better backup They've got more technical resources to call up. You know, in the sense that uh, in my day, we didn't have 
uh, the computerized records that they've got. We didn't have the scenes of crimes officers they've got, the ph photographers, the fingerprint experts, and so on. We used to do uh, most of that ourselves. We would search a scene and uh, dust for fingerprints and so on. But because of the proliferation of crime and the number of people that are resorting to a crime, I don't think they've got the same facility that we had, which was possibly to be able to distinguish who's committed the crime because of the type of crime that it was. There's such an abundance of crime. Now, you mentioned world. violence, uh, the increased violence <clears throat> uh, a moment ago, uh, and, of course, the British police always prided themselves on being unarmed. Yes. Do you think there's now a case with the fact many criminals use guns these days of the police being armed? Well, I, I'm, I feel that it's inevitable that the police will be armed. I think it would be a tragedy, and so do the policemen. The ordinary policemen, the majority of senior policemen feel this too. They don't want to be armed. But you see, they're in a situation where it's ludicrous to expect them to go into a situation where they're facing an armed cr and desperate criminal. Why should the, uh, the British public ask them to do this? And I don't think it's fair, I don't think it's right. But uh, they would hate the, to be forced into a situa situation where they would have to be armed as a matter of course. The, at the moment, they, they resent it. And uh, I personally think that it's, it's a, a backward step because that's not what British policing was all about. Were there any criminals in your career that you, you got to know and uh, did cases with that you liked? There were certainly some. I mean, the, the, uh, the con men were, the, were the, the people that uh, always <coughs> commanded respect in my view. I mean, they, they were still criminals, of course, and they, they uh, created havoc. But uh, nevertheless, they were a different breed. They, they were not totally nonviolent. And uh, they would always say that, uh, that an insurance company would pay for what they'd done or that there was justification for what they'd done. Of course, there never was, but nevertheless, they tried to justify their misdeeds in that fashion. But they were a different breed from uh, those that resorted to violence. Did, didn't you know a con man who swallowed a razor blade or something? Oh, indeed. Yeah. This was a man who... Uh, who uh, had, had stolen some luggage. He, he did this in a very plausible fashion, but he'd stolen some luggage and eventually all he wanted really was a checkbook and he'd gone off to the Waldorf Hotel and he'd gone through the luggage and found the checkbook and, and he ordered a large meal and some wine and so on and he was perfectly satisfied that that's all he wanted. But what he didn't, didn't realise was that there was a great hue and cry because he'd actually stolen something from an American officer that was supposed to have contained some secret papers point of fact it didn't but nevertheless he was arrested eventually there was a big hue and cry and he was arrested he was taken to the police station and and charged and very shortly afterwards he called the station officer and said look I think you ought to get an ambulance because I swallowed a razor blade and he had and this was something that he did fairly regularly whenever he was arrested in order to acclimatize him for the rigors of prison after the nice soft and very comfortable life that he'd been leading he would swallow a razor blade, go into prison for a couple of weeks while, while this thing was eventually removed from him and quite enjoy himself. His tummy must have had a lot of scars on it. Indeed, yes, <laughs> but this, this is something they did quite often. Now, one reads a lot about uh, detectives being uh, offered bribes uh, and in some cases accepting bribes from criminals. Uh, how, how common is that? Well, it must be fairly common because uh, we've seen evidence of this through the courts and so on. But... Uh, I, c I can only remember on a couple of occasions that pe people have offered me bribes, and these were uh, very tentative approaches, no more than that. They weren't really uh, positive uh, attempts to bribe me. They were feeling their way. Did you uh, ever feel tempted to accept? Well, there was no question about it. There was no question about it at all, because uh, it's a question of training and background, I think. I was very fortunate because I was trained uh, by a man that, that knew all the, uh, the pitfalls that a young detective might fall into. And so I benefited from that, and so there was never any reason or, or, or uh, necessity to do it, in my view. Mr. Reid, I understand that in the course of your investigations, you uh, sometimes, perhaps quite often, used to put on a disguise. Is that true? Yes, it is. And I, I used to do this from, uh, from a very early age, from the time that I first started as a detective, because I, I thought it was essential. It, a, a detective has to have this chameleon-like quality to be able to, to melt into the background and to be discreet. Because my view is that a criminal that's actually uh, on the street doing some kind of, of misdeed can, can see you twice. 
once he'll barely notice you. He's always suspicious, of course. The next time he will notice you. And so you mustn't be able to see you uh, more than those number of times. So what? I adopted various disguises. Well, I was going to say, what kind of disguise? Uh, well, as a railway porter, when I was doing an observation in a public house that was frequented by railwomen, as a milkman when we raided premises to uh, arrest an escaped burglar, uh, and uh, as a parson in order to make my way into the uh, prison chapel where I was interviewing criminals who were... Uh, very courageously, in my view, telling me tales about the Cray brothers and others in that organization. You went in as a parson? Yes. A a and then what did you do? Did you, did you in interrogate people in there? Well, they were making statements, you see. They wanted to make statements about their relationship with, with the organization and what, the, what they had done and what the Crays had done. Yeah. And so this was really the only venue that was uh, sacrosanct in every sense uh, and, and where they could safely um, make their statement to me without the knowledge of their, their fellow prisoners. That did was did you record these statements? Oh, indeed, indeed. I was always conscious of the fact that uh, in that situation at that time there was a very strong possibility that I, to use the phrase, would be fitted up. In but, other words, that I, I would be getting statements from them under duress. But if a, if, a, if a parson goes into a prison carrying a tape recorder, yes. he's rather suspect, isn't he? Well, it? indeed it would have been, but you see, what I did was this. I had a box file that, that I uh, filled with, with uh, foam rubber and put my tape recorder in that and the microphone, and then the outside of the box file had a little uh, label which said Songs of Praise. <laughs> so this was very interesting. <laughs> How much does uh, a detective have to rely on informers? Well, to an inordinate degree, really, because they are the only people that knows it, know exactly what's going on, apart from the criminal himself. And so you need to cultivate people like that uh, in order to get the, the kind of first-hand information which is so very essential. What is the going rate for informers? Well, that depends, of course, on the, the quality and the success rate of the actual job. Uh, it could be a hundred pounds, it could be two hundred pounds, it could be a thousand pounds. But it would depend on the number of people arrested, the property recovered and so on. What do you think of the advent of what I think are now called super grasses, people like Bertie Smalls, who I yes. believe you, you knew? Yes. Well, again, they, he, for example, was essential in that investigation because he was the only common thread through all the offences that were committed, and so therefore he was the only one in a position to inform on his colleagues. Uh, whether it's a nice thing or not uh, is not in question. It's a terrible thing. I mean, it, it's something that has been distasteful from the very first one, Judas. Uh, they've always been a very unsavory characters, but nevertheless, essential people, because as I, I said, they know what's going on. And the supergrass has been recognized, I suppose, not officially as a matter of policy, but the police and the Home Office and the prison authorities have recognized that they should have some kind of special treatment. They get a reduction in their sentence because they are responsible. I mean, Smalls, I think, uh, informed on something like 200 people. They got 300 years imprisonment, something of that order. Which is, which is quite incredible. And so the balance is, is adjusted in the sense that had he not informed, uh, it may have been that he or the others would have uh, escaped justice and so on. Isn't there a danger, though, of informants setting up a crime in order to make money from it? This has happened, yes, and this is always the danger. This is where it's so important that the det detective must control his informant. There must be a, uh, a discipline, because otherwise the, the informant may well be... Uh, wants to set up somebody uh, falsely and maliciously in order to get inf information, money, or, and, uh, from the detective. Now, your most famous case, I think you would probably agree, was that of the Cray brothers. Did this pose any particular problems for you? Well, it did, because uh, the important thing there, thing there was, was to, uh, to guard against infiltration from people in the service and uh, to, who might pass on information back to the craze. And so it's essential there that the team should be handpicked and, and also that it should be in a situation that was removed from Scotland Yard and this we eventually succeeded in. How did you actually nail them? Because, I mean, they were tough people, they knew what the law was, they weren't going to give in easily. How did you actually manage to nail them? Well, what, what I did in fact was to, to go into the middle of them to, to, it was useless, I knew from experience, trying to get their victims, the victims of their violence, to uh, make statements against them because they thought, they thought was that the craze would never be arrested, that they were protected by some divine spirit. And so the only way, really, to try to get evidence against them was to go right in the middle and find one of their co-conspirators, one of their associates, 
who, for one reason or another, had fallen into disrepute. And that's what I did. I found a man who had had an argument with the Crays. He'd known them for a long period of time. Uh, he'd known about all their activities. He was a con man who tried to control and direct them, in fact. And so eventually, after a, a couple of confidence-building interviews, I managed to persuade him to give testimony, and he made a very long statement about all their activities. And this really was the start, the key, that opened the, uh, the door to the inquiry into the craze. When you say you had interviews with him, did you bring him into the yard, or did you go and see him at his place? Oh, good heavens, no, no, no. We went miles away into all kinds of uh, small hotels and this kind of thing, where it was very uh, discreet and where people wouldn't realize who we were and so on. We hired a room, and, and uh, we spent hours going through all the uh, evidence that he was able to give and so on. Is it true that the Cray brothers uh, had a price on your head of £5,000? Yes, it was. In fact, this we learned from uh, one of their fellow prisoners who made a statement eventually and said that that was the going rate then for uh, someone to come over from America and, and do the business on me. And do you? Did That's this right. worry you? Well, it did. Of course it did. It didn't for a time because threats like this are not uncommon uh, from criminals, but these were a different... Uh, breed. They were, they were men of violence, obviously, and, uh, and so because of that, I think I took it more seriously. Did you I carry a gun at that would. time? No, I didn't. Uh, th occasionally I did, but not uh, as a matter of, of routine. Mr. Reid, what do you think of the very long sentences that are being meted out, uh, meted out nowadays to hardened criminals? Uh, in, for instance, the train robbery case in which you were also mm. involved, I mean, mm. there were sentences of 30 years. Yes. What's your view on that? Well, I think that, that long sentences like that are, are totally unjustified. I don't think that... I, I think it, it breaks a man's character completely to serve a sentence like that. Now, you're on record as saying that you would like to see crime statistics published on a basis of race. Uh, is that not being anti-racial? No, I don't think it is, because what I, when I said that, what I meant by that was that I'd like to identify the problem. What is being suggested is that it's racist, but you see there are problems in places like Brixton and Bradford and Birmingham and Southall and so on. And, and we know that, that black youths are getting into trouble because they don't have work or because of their bad environment or because of lack of educational work for whatever reason. Why shouldn't we identify that and do something positive about it rather than saying it is, it, it's not happening, it'll go away. But is the thinking behind that that there are far more crimes committed by coloured people than the general public know about? Is that what the thinking is behind that? Wish I think yours? it's probably true, yes. I think it ought to be identified. And if it's a problem, then we can look at it. Yeah. Yeah. When you take a, a man into questioning, how do you get him to talk? Well, if a man's determined not to talk, you can't get him to talk. For example, I mean, you can't beat a, a confession from a man. That's absolutely impossible. So, really, it's a question of tr trying to indicate to him the kind of evidence that you've got indicate to him the evidence that is against him personally, uh, be it fingerprints or the fact that he was seen by a witness or the fact that you've recovered property from his address or that he's been named by a, uh, a co-conspirator or something of that order and then see what his reaction is and, and it's, there's nothing more than that to it really. I mean, do, do, do you use the kind of techniques one sometimes reads about of uh, blowing hot and cold, leaving him uh, for an hour or two, coming back for five minutes, leaving him for another hour? I mean, is these sort of techniques used? They are used that w w without any question, but, but personally I didn't bother with that too much because I think that what you've got to do is try to get some determination about the man himself to, to quickly gauge the calibre of the person that you're interrogating so that you know whether you're, you're going to be successful in uh, getting him to talk or not, whether you're wasting your time. And I think that in a, a fairly quick and brief interview you can determine that and then you know whether to go on or not. What is your view about the, ac the accused person's right to silence and the fact that, uh, by law, the detective is obliged to tell him that he doesn't have to say anything yeah. unless he wants to? What's your view of that? Well, uh, the, the caution. I, I personally think the caution is a waste of time because uh, most of the people that are cautioned don't realise they've been cautioned. You know, they're in a, a very traumatic state. They're in a police station maybe for the first time in their lives mm -hmm. and they see this person in authority intoning this business about not having to say anything unless they wish to do so. There is the possibility always that a, a, a completely innocent man may not say something that which would uh, extricate him from the actual crime. But the hardened professional criminal, it makes no uh, difference to him at all. He's heard it so many times that he would say, and very often has said to me, don't waste the time telling me that, Governor, and this kind of thing. But the right of silence, uh, 
I think some, some uh, indication should be taken of this by the court because people should be uh, persuaded in one fashion or another uh, by pressure, uh, by indicating to the court that this man didn't say anything in, in uh, reaction to, to the charge when it was laid against him or the question that was posed by the detective and so on. Because it's never protected the innocent person, it's always been a shield for the guilty and that's all. Now, we, we've also heard a, a very great deal recently about what's called the verbals, that's to say, allegations that uh, police officers have put into the accused's mouth things that he didn't say. And indeed, last week we had John McVicker here, and he alleged that in, uh, I think, most of the crimes he committed, while admitting he was guilty, he said that he'd, be, he said that he'd been verbaled. Now, verbaling goes on, we all know that. Now, is it done because the police um, often know that a man is guilty yet haven't got the evidence to nail him? Is that the reason for it? In fact, I was just about to ask you that. I wonder whether John McVicker uh, had been convicted merely on the, the evidence of verbals or whether there was substantial evidence to back it up. Oh, yes, he would admit there was. And yes. he doesn't deny that he yes. was guilty, but he says that there were occasions. And indeed, there are many, many instances which I could quote to you of, of mm. where there have been verbals. And what I wanted to get from you was, was, was why it is done, when it's done. Is it because a lack of evidence and a feeling where well, we know this man did it, but, but we can't get him otherwise? I'm sure that's the case. I'm sure that the, the situation is that there's a paucity of evidence uh, against a particular individual and so in order to to just redress the balance a little bit the, an, an officer will go to the extreme of, of verbaling a man and and uh, putting into his mouth words that he didn't say which indicate that he committed the crime uh, m mr reed have you ever verbaled anybody i've never needed to no. i've never needed to because it's amazing that what people say when they're arrested it yeah. truly is and always, I think, personally, that it's bad detective work. If you can't get the evidence, then you can't charge a person, and it's as simple as that. What do you say to the suggestion that interrogation should be tape-recorded? Well, personally, I'm a very great believer in this. I think very strongly that it should be. It's, it's a precaution that I've taken myself on many occasions, and it served me in very good stead. Uh, I've already told privately. you. You've just done it privately. Privately, yeah. without any authority at all, and, yeah. and it had no legal standing in court, mm -hmm. but it served me in good stead in one particular case that I, I can recall where I uh, tape recorded surreptitiously a conversation that I'd had mm -hmm. with a man who'd made some very startling admissions. And I, of course, gave this in evidence, uh, or at least started to give it in evidence, but his lawyer stopped this, and there was the inevitable trial within a trial while the judge, in the absence of the jury, tried to decide whether the evidence should be admitted to the jury. And uh, this went on until lunchtime, and at the lunchtime break, I spoke to his, his counsel, who I knew, and said, if you, if you could be here at 10 minutes to 2, I can let you listen to something and I let him listen to a passage on this tape recording of the actual conversation that we'd had and he realized that everything that I'm saying was perfectly true and so he withdrew the objections the case went on and my evidence was heard mm. but I think that it should be tape recorded because uh, it's a protection it indicates exactly what the, co the conversation uh, mm. between the prisoner and the detective was and in fact my view is that they should be videotaped mm. it has been suggested that, that when a criminal Yes, of course, if it was videotaped, this wouldn't happen, what I'm going to suggest to you. But it has been suggested that if a criminal knows that his uh, interrogation is going to be tape recorded, he'll be tempted to say halfway through it, oh, stop twisting my arm, Gov, yes, you're hurting indeed. me. That's one of the problems, of course. Yeah. Uh, but if it were videotaped yeah. from the very beginning, this would obviate uh, that possibility at all. And that's what do you, I think do you agree with uh, Sir David McNee, the uh, Metropolitan Police Commissioner, that the police should be given wider powers? Well, they should, but uh, the problem that I think is that we're facing is that the question of what the public reaction will be, because uh, there is no way that the police in this country can operate uh, without the total support of the general public. And when, we, when Sir David suggests that he wants prisoners or suspects to be able to be locked up in the police station for 72 hours, I, I dread to think what the public reaction would be. Uh, we know that the, at the moment uh, suspects are kept for 24 hours and they can be kept for longer if there's uh, a good reason and they can go before a court and, and so on. But 72 hours sounds a long time. The temptation might always be to keep them up to the min maximum period. Uh, and, uh, and of course the other thing is that it will only be necessary to use that power on a very limited number of occasions. 
But if it's there in writing and it's, a, it's an authoritative uh, situation, the general public will feel that it's used <coughs> far more often than it probably is. Mm -hmm. Now, Mr. Reid, you were at the yard at the time that uh, several hundred uh, police officers were either sacked or had to retire or resign because of corruption. Did that come as a surprise to you? Well, uh, the fact that there was corruption in the police force didn't because... Uh, it was, it was apparent that there was some measure of corruption. But certainly when the, the revelation was made, I was absolutely horrified at the extent of it. Because, and I think everyone concerned was, all the people that were doing the investigation were in fact, In fact, I think as you said, said earlier, when you were investigating the Cray case, you were so worried about bent police officers uh, getting back to the Crays, what you were doing, that you moved your headquarters somewhere Yes, indeed. Else. That's yeah. right. That's absolutely right. Uh, does it surprise you that uh, several years after that event happened, um, there are still, I think, some 60 officers at the present time uh, under investigation? It does surprise me, and it surprised me, as I've said, the extent uh, and the, uh, uh, of that corruption, because I would have thought one example would have been enough to deter anyone, and yet there are still cases under investigation. People are still appearing before the courts on most serious charges of, of corruption, and I'm absolutely astounded that they don't take cognizance of what's happened before and, uh, and just not do it. Is it because the rewards of corruption, that's to say the money that's now involved in crime, millions a year, uh, are something which are put in the police's way and which, they, which are not put in my way or normal people's way, it's put in their way and this that they find hard to resist, is this what it is? I would have said a few years ago, no because I never appreciated that there was that kind of money available to bribe policemen. But listening to some of the evidence and reading about the evidence in, the, in some of the recent cases, then it was very obvious that there wasn't uh, an inordinate amount of money available for that very purpose. So I suppose that if a, a, a detective or a police officer of any kind is in a situation where somebody says to him, well, look, that is what I can give you, the temptation he's got then to make the decision, yes or no. And it must be very tempting to him, I suppose, if he's uh, of inclined that way at all. Do you think um, that in fields like drugs, especially marijuana, and the selling of uh, pornographic lit uh, literature, the law could be changed to make uh, corruption less possible for policemen? I think it certainly could in, in the case of, of pornography, because that's one of the dangerous areas. That's one of the problems that, that uh, resulted in, in the arrest of so many officers before in what was called the Dirty Book Squad. And certainly I think there that a new look should be taken to, to that, to legalise pornography in one way or another. And let's shift from corrupt policemen to corrupt lawyers. Uh, Sir Robert Mark has said on several occasions that there are bent lawyers. Have you come across them in your experience? Well, not, uh, the, again, in the sense that I could prefer charges against them or produce a massive evidence, but certainly enough to make me very suspicious of them and to, uh, to indicate to uh, persons in authority that their uh, future cases should be watched. Look, looking at uh, what you described earlier as an enormous increase in crime since you first became a detective, <coughs> have you thought, as a result of your experience, of any ways at all in which crime could be reduced? Society's got to change. There's got to be a rethink about society. People have got to decide what kind of society they want to live in, whether they are content to live in the society where so many people commit crime, whether they allow so much crime to uh, uh, proliferate, or whether they want a more orderly society with a, a decent British type of police force rather than the kind of thing we were talking about earlier, uh, an armed paramilitary organization. Yeah. Of course, when you started your career, there was a stigma at, uh, attached to crime and the criminal, wasn't That's there? Right. And I wouldn't say there was so That's much right. now. It's gone now. You see, that was a, that was a social barrier. Mm. People who were uh, involved with the police or went to court or went to prison, mm. uh, there was that. They were totally stigmatized for, for mm. a very long time, and so were their children and their family. Mm. And the result of that was that people were reluctant to uh, become involved in crime. Now that's all gone. Uh, that's completely removed. And uh, people don't seem to worry. In fact, it's par for the course almost that a young kid goes to a juvenile court or goes to a remand home and uh, it's considered uh, something of an accolade in, in their particular circle and so on. Uh, lastly, uh, Mr. Reid, I've heard it said that uh, detectives and criminals are really two sides of the same coin. Uh, uh, that a man who chooses to become a policeman might uh, perhaps have chosen to become a criminal. Is that a fanciful idea or is there any truth in it? 
Well, it's often been said, you know, you've got to, you set a thief to catch a thief. You've got to be a, a, almost a criminal to, to be a detective. I don't think that's right. It may have been right in, in, the, in the old Bow Street days, but uh, certainly not in these days. We're, we're, we've got to know the criminals. We've got to know their, their background, their, the way they feel, the way they think. Uh, and likewise, they, they would want to do the same with us because we're, we're their uh, very apparent adversary. But uh, I don't think you need to, to get too involved and embroiled in the criminal underworld to be a successful detective. And, and you, Mr. Reed, never thought yourself of becoming a criminal? No, I didn't. Thank goodness. Thank you very much.